Welcome to NP's Changing Practice. I am Dr. Carol Berger, and I'm so pleased to have Mark Johnson here with us today. Mark is a PA I have known and worked with for over 12 years. Um, I think it's been about 12 years now um, in acute care. Mark has mainly been in ER, um, but I think you worked as a hospitalist for a while too, didn't you? I did. Yeah, yeah. So he's kind of got a well-rounded um, experience, and we our topic today is going to be imposter syndrome starting your career. So, Mark, tell us a little bit about what started you on this journey. Thanks, Carol, um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm excited for your third season. And um, I know we've talked a long time about finally getting together, and I'm thankful that we can finally make this happen. Um, but yeah, I've been a PA now for about 19 years. I shudder to think that it has actually been that long. I but, know, the time really um, starts to go, doesn't it? It, it sure does. Um, I actually decided to become a PA from a very practical sense. Um, I was a medical technologist in the lab for about four years, and I decided to go back to school. And I really looked at, you know, what could I do in a couple of years to maximize my income and also use my experience. And um PA is something that came up. Um, uh, I didn't know at the time how difficult it was to get into school. I didn't know how difficult the school was. Thankfully, I was young and ambitious, um, and I pushed forward, and thankfully, I got into school right away, and um, I went to school at the University of Iowa, which was just about half hour from my home, and uh, so it worked out well, and uh, I, it's hard to believe that I'm going on close to 20 years of practice. Yeah, and, now uh, you've got the name, you know, those initials. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. You know, okay, you graduated. PA is behind your name and you are on your first job. How does that feel? Yeah, um, very exciting. Uh, so all of those that are, are listening who are getting done with school, um, it's, a, it's a very exciting time. But there's always a lot of things up in the air that you just don't know. A lot of unknowns that what, what if uh, whatever may happen. And uh, with the excitement um, of, of completing all of that, there's a huge sense of accomplishment. But now it's the next stage of uh, now I have to find a job and I have to figure out, hey, is this the right job? Is it the right place? Is it the right environment for me? And, and that is going to be difficult for anyone to tell you. It really is a, something where you have to analyze the situation based on your needs, your wants, and, and where you want to go with your career. And the hard part about that, Carol, is often people don't know where they want to go. I mean, can you remember? You just, mm -hmm. you just want a job. I remember because I was working in the hospital, which is where I was most familiar with, but I became an MNP, which is family. So I never worked in an office environment in my, you know, my career. So that was kind of scary. Um, but yeah, so I got a job in the hospital right away, which, but again, it, it just, you're, it's a whole new role and it's a whole new way of looking at things. So it was well, a lot looking, of anxiety. Yeah. And looking back, it's, you know, if somebody at time said, well, what are you looking for? I probably wouldn't have known other than I need a job that pays my bills mm -hmm. and I yeah. just want a job period. And especially with the job market post COVID, a lot of things changed during that time that um, it came to the point where maybe people didn't even have options. Um, but assuming you finally have found a job, then comes in a lot of things that uh, I can recall. Um, a big one is the same thing that a, a lot of us as, as students had is imposter syndrome. And, and that's just the feeling of, um, Everyone else in the room is a smart one, and I'm the idiot. Even though I somehow got to this point in my life, I somehow tricked a bunch of people, and uh -huh. I really shouldn't be here. And who are you to talk about this or that? Because you're by no means an expert here. And when you get in that position, it it's, can be very difficult. It can almost be paralyzing for a lot of people. And that's something that a lot of people are going to face. Uh, and they should know that a lot of that is normal. But you really have to to push through that and say, okay, I'm just as good as anyone else here in this room. I've I've met all these requirements, and um, this is something that I can do. Well, and I, the other thing I try to stress to my students too is that they might feel alone, but they're not that alone. 
there are people all around you that you can ask a question for, and you're not going to look dumb. You can find those people that become your avenue of people, even if it's just sending a text. I mean, there's so many times that I'll send a text to a doctor uh, who's a specialist in this or that, because I think I know what I want to do, but I just want to hear, yeah, I'm on the right track. And you really will build those um, those relationships, I think, is at least that's how it was for me. How was it for you? You were more in an ER environment. So you had a lot of people around you and a lot of commotion going on at one time. Well, um, I would say that it wasn't as supportive as it could have been. Um, unfortunately, it was kind of like, hey, you're getting started. Let's let's get to it. Um, and um, unfortunately, there was a lot of trial by fire and um, that doesn't work out so well. And I'll be talking about that more later. But um, yeah, at times I felt like I was flaming and it wasn't sometimes always the environment where I could really ask for help and not feel like an absolute idiot. And that's, that's a difficult thing to deal with. And so I think learning the people who can have your back when things like that happen, even if they're to in a totally different practice, um, but hopefully before you even get the job, you can figure out, hey, is this going to be a place that's going to be supportive for me? But the reality of it is you very well may get into a job where they're not supportive like that. Um, in fact, um, people sometimes can be difficult with the new person. Like, let's let's see how they prove themselves. I, I don't know if you've uh, felt that, but I've seen it multiple times with NPs, PAs, physicians. Mm -hmm. And when they get first get started, they're kind of like the target of okay, let's let's figure out how how good you really are. You think you're hot stuff. And that can be a really difficult time if you're I just have coming had, in. Yeah, I, I can relate to that in some of the jobs I've had where, you know, the person isn't the, the welcoming mentor that you hope. But like you mentioned, you can build that network outside of the practice that you're in too. You know, I mean, you can, you can reach out to people that you know from other places, other PAs or NBs that, you, that are experts in things that you can kind of text or or sound something off of if you you need to. Well, absolutely. And I thankfully right now I work with some of the greatest doctors I've worked with in my career. And they will often text their friends, maybe from medical school and ask, hey, have you seen this before? Or maybe they have a friend who's in neurosurgery or something. And they'll ask a question. And that is so healthy. Um, it's very important to know that we're not going to know everything. That, to know that, the people to yeah. ask. And, and also, um, the, the problem is the longer you wait to ask what you think is a stupid question, the harder it becomes. Um, let me give you an example. So um, epistaxis in the ER, nosebleeds. Um, I was terrified of, doing, uh, of taking care of one. Why? Because I really didn't see many of those in PA school. And I didn't even know where to start. And so if it's simple, then that wouldn't be a big deal, but if I had to cauterize or do any sort of packing, I really had no clue. And the longer I waited, the more nervous I was that someone was going to ask me to take care of it until finally the doctor I worked with said, hey, Mark, you don't seem to like to pick up these nosebleeds. And I'm thinking, oh, I, I thought he didn't notice that. <laughs> and thankfully, uh, on this day, which wasn't always the case, but on this day, he was actually very helpful and walked me through like, hey, this is what you do. And to this very day, when I have students come in, I'm like, okay, this can be very nerve wracking, um, but it doesn't have to be. Let me show you just some steps to take. And a lot of it is about, okay, let's take a deep breath. There's a lot of blood. How are we going to manage this? Taking it small steps here, because this is something that you can do. And always kind of knowing if it gets to the point where, hey, this is beyond what we can do, knowing when to call the specialist. And after you do that so many times, it does get easier. But the first time is always the hardest. I, I, I agree. That first step, I used to feel the same way with suturing. I mean, I was like, oh, please don't come to me if you need stitches, because I can't even remember how to hook the tail and make the triple knot. And, you know, I, I would get, you know, I do, you, if you don't do something very often, you don't, you know, know how to do it. And you're right. If you wait and wait and wait to ask that question, 
then it just becomes harder to ask it. But um, you when somebody walks you through it, it's so much nicer, so much easier. I wish we could be more gentler with each other and, you know, less judgmental and just be more of a team. Well, and that, I think that's, there's, there's a lot of literature about, um, learning, um, shame and, and like, oh, I can't believe you don't know that or, you know, and, and they used to think that shaming people actually people would would learn better and they would they would feel bad about it and then go and get better but the proof there's not proof that that really works um what really works is is to be supportive of your colleague like hey uh, you don't understand this that's fine let me walk you through it because guess what there may be something that you're really good at that i don't have much experience and when you can be in an environment where you're helping each other it is it makes really so much difference in um, your practice and also your life in general, because you're not nervous about, well, what if I have to deal with this difficult person today or a difficult situation? And what if I run into a problem and Dr. So-and-so is not gonna be able to help me with it or not willing to help me with it? And um, uh, as NPs and PAs, we, we need to have physicians who are willing to walk alongside with us walk us through it, even though they're having a busy day, they're going to be right there to help us. If we feel like we're, we're, you know, to the point that we, we don't know what to do next. I love that. Yeah. I love what you said, walking alongside us. I really like that, that, that imagery, even that, you know, we're all there to help patients and not to prove who's better, who went to the better school, who has the better degree and all of the internal, you know, kind of a push and pull there can be among different um, titles, I guess, but that we're walking alongside each other and we need to help each other. Um, Another thing you mentioned I really liked was that you discovered that even the physicians didn't have all the answers. Yeah, and and, uh, um, after a while, you may feel like you have more answers than some of the, uh, when I worked in the small town, some of these doctors that would come in, they might be desperate to get doctors in there. And some of the doctors that came in, honestly, were a little scary to work with because you thought they would know so much more than you. And when they didn't, you're like, this could be a problem. Um, but I, I think it's just very healthy for every one of us to be able to say, um, I'm really good at this, but I struggle with this, or I'm not sure about that. Let's look that up or let's check up to date and see what they recommend. Uh-huh. Because even the smartest person who graduated, um, let's say 20 years ago, you're like, oh, they have it made. Well, guess what? So much has changed since then. And, and so um, it can be an advantage. It can also be a disadvantage that you're just getting out of school and you've actually learned the newer approach to it. And maybe you can actually teach me, hey, this is how we're doing it these days. Even though you've been doing it this way so many different times, um, this is how they're currently teaching it. And that's one thing I really like about having students because it it keeps us fresh. Oh, I I could totally agree. So you also mentioned a little bit about COVID. So what do you think COVID did to the profession? Um, Well, I think it magnified a lot of the problems that we already had. Um, It definitely increased the stress of all of us. Um, Some of my colleagues were laid off. Um, many had hours cut, many had hourly rates cut, many had benefits cut because the companies were telling us that, um, you know, people aren't coming to the ER, therefore all the money that we normally would get is just not there. And a lot of these companies have already cut a lot of administrators. And so there's not much more to cut. Uh It also showed that the hospitals in general, the way we have all the finances set up is is really um, not great. Um, we're depending on one day surgery patients to come in or surgery patients in general to come in to really make the hospital money to generate a lot of income. And if people stop coming, the hospital basically goes out of business. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, they're trying to get by with fewer people. And that was the case for a while until the floodgates opened up with COVID. And then, of course, um, uh, units full of COVID patients. And now all of a sudden, we're wearing multiple gowns. We're wearing multiple masks. We're gloving two or three times. Beard. Um, you we know. had beard covers. You had beard yes. covers. And I mean, it was like 
it was a, a ordeal just getting dressed. Yeah, and <clears throat> for me, um, that's around the time that I worked in hospital medicine. And at the time I thought, oh, this could be good because at least I know whether it's a COVID patient or not. Um, but I might be stuck in the COVID unit all day. And that's all the patients I would see. And these, these were very sick COVID patients. And to see people isolated to the room where nobody wanted to go into because they had COVID. And most of these being elderly folks who were pretty lonely. I found that a lot of my care involved talking to them about mentally um, getting themselves through this because um, often it wasn't the medical problem. It was mentally, they just didn't think that they could they go were on. Lonely. They were very lonely and nobody was rushing in there to help them because in order to bring them a cup of water, you had to get all of this gowns on. And it seemed like almost daily that the, the, rules were changing okay now we're doing it this way and now we're doing it that way and you're, you're and we, they couldn't have visitors i mean it was so sad it it was it was very sad and um i remember one conversation that i had very distinctly i was talking to an elderly man's daughter on the phone and she started to cry and she said what if what if dad dies and he's all by himself and i was I was used to having phone calls with family, but I unexpectedly started to cry and I had to put the phone down and I'm like, what's going on here? Like, I'm, I'm not afraid to show emotion, but this was totally unexpected. And I had to take a moment and I talked to her and I said, you know, this is really difficult and I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I wish we could do things different. And I always, if I felt like somebody was to the point that they were dying, that I would definitely um, advocate for their families to come in or things like that. But some of these patients were sick for weeks upon weeks and you'd think they were getting better. Um, in fact, I had one case, I was going to send this guy home, but he wasn't able to eat. And so we decided to keep him for a couple more days. And on the second day, checking on him, he got confused and, and long story short, he became septic ended up in the ICU for several weeks and, and eventually died. But that's the kind of things that we would see very frequently. It was so unexpected. Yeah. I mean, things that, you know, you normally would know how the course would run. Yes. And it just didn't always follow that course. I mean, so like you said, you took a right turn when you thought you were going to take a left and, and you had to step in for family a lot of time because family just weren't able to be there. Yeah. And you, uh, I, I'm sure you recall a lot more conversations about um, uh, DNR status and um, if they're going to the ICU, the likelihood of them living, especially an elderly with any sort of medical problems wouldn't weigh down. And those are difficult conversations to have because this is typically somebody who is going to make it through just fine. But once they have COVID and you see their x-ray, um, you had to have a conversation with family and you were very happy you did if the patient did pass away because at least you're able to talk to the family, able to talk to the patient, hopefully, and get their wishes so that if something happened, at least we could all be assured that we had a conversation. This is what they wanted and didn't want so that we were able to honor their wishes. Um, but these are pretty heavy things to talk about and in a typical environment where, hey, we're going to meet you at the hospital, give you some medicines, then you'll go home. Um, all of a sudden, you're having conversations like, I, I don't think they're probably going to make it. And um, what do you want and not want? And so, so I think it's changed all of us. And even though the pandemic is over, we are still feeling the effects of that to this very day. You make a statement here that's real interesting here. You said that they called us heroes, but we didn't feel like heroes. No, I, yeah, they called us healthcare heroes, but, and we may have had a couple of perks on gasoline, a few things, but I said, we're kind of getting screwed in this deal. Like we're the heroes here and yet we're getting hours cut. Our paychecks are going down. Um, we're not sure if we'll have a job tomorrow. Um, we're, we're being exposed to the sickest of people. And it just didn't seem like 
it, it all matched up. Welcome. Like, it didn't it seem like a hero's welcome. No, that's, that's exactly, that's a good way of saying it. It didn't feel like a hero's welcome. It felt like um, you guys are doing great. Just keep doing your thing. But that's often how it is in healthcare. It's like, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, when inside a lot of us wanted to say, we're dying here, please help us. But it goes back to a lot of times we don't talk about that because we like to represent ourselves as very strong people, very resilient people who can get through anything. And that's we always the way it's have the right been. answer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so kind of want to wrap this up with, you know, what did you wish you had known when you first started out? If, if you're, you could go back in time and tell your younger you, uh, what was, what things were going to be like, or what you would wish you had known, what would they be? So, yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, it comes from the perspective of, again, um, working almost 20 years, but also I managed for, I don't know, four or five years um, where I would um, hire NPs or PAs to work in the emergency room or in hospital medicine. Um, the one thing, I, the first thing I'll say is that you're valued at every stage of your career. Um, so, yes, you may be young and you're the newbie. But along with that often comes more enthusiasm for the work, more excitement to get things going, um, willingness to learn new things. And so even though, yes, you don't have a lot of that experience, um, coming in with that attitude often is refreshing to everyone else on the team and it often will encourage everyone else to, to remember like, hey, I remember back then when I used to get excited about this. Um, and so I think valuing that because there is definitely a value to that that you bring to it um i would also say that you'll never reach the pinnacle of learning that you think you're going to learn like when i get to learn all of these things then it's just going to be perfect guess what there's always going to be somebody smarter than you that knows more than you so yes reach reach to get better at always i think it's that's important but don't feel like you have to, you'll finally get on top of the mountain and, and you'll be there because by tomorrow, there'll be another article coming out and you won't know everything. <laughs> That's true. Um, uh, also, I wish I would have spoke up for myself earlier in my career. Um, and what I want to say is that it is okay to speak up for yourself, meaning that, um, yes, you're the newbie and yes, you may get some of the not as great shifts at first or, or whatever. Um, but there does come a point where it's just like, okay, hey, we're, we're, we're all doing the same job here. And so how can we be equally respectful to everyone on the team? Um, because, you know, you guys schedule me for every Christmas for the next five years because I'm the new person. It's really not working very well for my family because I have yeah. kids X, Y, or Z. Um, and so it's okay to speak up for yourself. And and it doesn't have to be in a nasty way to say, hey, here's what I noticed. Is there any way that we could, you know, work with work this? around this? Yeah, I, I got to yeah. have some time with my family. And, you know, if, if they're any type of a decent employer, they're going to hear that. They should, you would think. Um, but it really depends a lot of times on managers as well. Um, the other thing that I had was that burnout can affect you any time in your career. And this was very interesting for me because burnout is something that um, I think we'll talk about on a different episode, but it can affect you in school, in your first couple of years, middle of career or end of career. That was very eye-opening to me because I always thought that it's not until you've been doing this for so long, you're just tired of the system and that's when you burn out. And they're finding that that's not the case. A lot of the burnout we're seeing are people who are just getting out and they're overwhelmed. And we have got to raise awareness to this problem and make it better. Um, yeah, and the I look forward to our, our we're going to do another podcast. So be sure and tune in, guys, because we are going to do another one on burnout. And, and Mark's got a great perspective on it. Yeah, and the last thing I was going to mention is that when you get that new job, just remember that your legacy is at home. It's not at work. And someone once told me that, and, and I remembered that comment because, you know, it used to be you'd work 30, 40, 50 years for a company and they'd name a, a library after you. But unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. You might work five or six years for a company. They get bought out or you get a new contract group. And now you might be with that company for five years and then you move on to someone else. 
And guess what? Nobody's keeping track of all those sacrifices that you're making. And so even though you recall them, nobody else is, is realizing those. And it's appreciated to a point, but just realizing that your legacy is at home. And when you make sacrifices to miss your kid's game or an important event, that's going to happen. But whenever you're able to, don't sacrifice those things because you're going to go down, like for me, 20 years later, how did I um, value my legacy at home? And thankfully, I can say that I really tried to be balanced, but I missed a lot of things too. It's a, it's but, a very easy uh, thing to be able to get caught up into this machinery of, you know, so many shifts and so many hours and they always need you. Um, you know, I mean, and so you can get caught up in working so much that you're absolutely right. You can forget yourself and forget your friends and forget your husbands and wives and your children and just get caught up into work, work, work and making money and not even about the money. Sometimes it's just the work. There's so much of it. Um, and you can lose yourself. So. You can. And I remember in, when I was, uh, one of the PA schools I interviewed at, I said, for two years, I'm not going to have a life. I realized that. And the guy's like, whoa, wait, wait. <laughs> there may be some truth to that, but, but you have got to have time with family. You have got to find balance even during this crazy time, because um, you can you need all of that support. And the same goes for your work. Like you can pour your life into your job, but at, at, when you come home, you need your family to be there. Um, and they, they need you to be there as well. And they need you to be present, not on your phone, answering this or that text. Or and, charting and, or boundary, yeah. charting or whatever that is. Yep. Right. Cause you know, we've both been in that situation and, and yeah, you, you want to get some of those things done, but there is a point where you have to say, okay, I'm home now. I need to be present, um, mentally and physically. Yeah, because I can remember some of my first jobs too. I would come home and I would look at dinner as a break. I got to, to a different location, my now my home office, you know, but I got to eat dinner with the family. That was good. And then I would be charting for the rest of the night. And I had to stop and say, what am I doing? You know, you have to have some time with your family, not always be locked away and, and busy. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. You really bring such insightfulness um, to, to our profession, right? And I um, want to remind our audience to check out our website, MP's Changing Practice. We have games, case studies, and lots of things to help you study. Also, we're going to have a link up there for Mark. He has a blog called PA for Life Coaching. Is it PA4, like the number four, co lifecoaching.com. And uh, you, uh, we'll have a link up there for you so that you can check it out anytime. Uh, so thank you all. And we will see you uh, next time. Thanks, Carol.